Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. My name is Jackie Locke, and I'm the Communications Advisor in the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science here at Memorial. We acknowledge that the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups, and we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on these lands from where you are located and the Indigenous peoples for whom these lands are traditional territory. The Speaking of Engineering lecture series promotes engineering in our province and raises awareness above, about engineering-related issues among students, the academic community, and the general public, which we feel is pretty important. I'd like to expend, extend special greetings to this evening's presenters. And next to me here, Dr. Kelly Halbolt, a chemical engineer and professor in the Department of Process Engineering. And to her left, Dr. Michael Katz, an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry. And next to him, Dr. Chris Paduska, a professor in the Department of Physics and Physical Oceanography. And Dr. Leslie James, a professor in the Department of Process Engineering. So welcome. This lecture series is sponsored by the Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Newfoundland and Labrador, also known as Pegano. Mark Feuer is the CEO and Registrar of, Peg Registrar of Peganel and sends his regrets as he could not attend this evening's lecture. Peganel is an invaluable asset to our program and our graduates, and we are honored to partner with them to bring you this lecture series. Tonight's talk is about the role of carbon capture utilization and storage in green energy transition. This evening, you'll hear from a panel of memorial professors who will share their expertise in this very important field. Before we begin, a couple of logistic details. We will plan to have time for questions after all of our speakers have presented. And um, so our first speaker is Dr. Kelly Halbolt, a professor in the Department of Process Engineering. And she is committed to helping Canadians produce, use, and conserve resources while protecting our environment. Dr. Halbolt, Halbolt focuses on engaging regions in the circular economy through the creation of processes and products in regions where infrastructure, distance to market, low volumes and highly diverse feedstock require innovative and integrated approaches. She works with a multidisciplinary group of chemists, biochemists and ocean scientists to develop green processes that products and products that fit regional needs and abilities, ensuring remote and rural regions can be sustainably developed. Welcome Dr. Halbolt. What will happen is I'll forget to turn it on for weeks. So uh, thanks very much. Thanks for everybody coming. I'm going to do an intro slide, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the stuff I do in carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Don't say that very quickly many times. And then I'll introduce Mike, and then we'll go through. Uh, we're going to focus more on anthropogenic uh, sources of carbon. And when we say carbon, we don't just mean CO2. We mean methane. We mean any of the... Uh, emissions associated with stacks or any kind of combustion of biofuel or fossil fuels or stent, uh, landfill gases, all of those things that are not only greenhouse gases, but they're pollutants. So you'll see from this slide, we've got a bunch of different sources. We have the fugitive sources. I'll just gesture with my hands. Those are things that are coming from tanks on your left. We've got landfills. They're huge sources of greenhouse gases. We've got large power plants small stacks, big stacks associated with engines. And then we've also got uh, waste biomass. So you can think of forestry residues that are stockpiled or fish residues that are discharged in the ocean or left in landfills. Those are all emission sources. CO2 is the one we always think about, but there's lots of other greenhouse gases. There's nitrous oxides, there's methane. Water is a greenhouse gas. 
There's also other emissions associated with these, like nitrogen oxides, as I said, water and light hydrocarbons. And you can't really think of just CO2 because they're almost always emitting together. Uh, I'm going to talk first about the stuff I do. Then we'll get to those other people. And we look, where I look at is trying to capture carbon and other pollutants in uh, physical absorbance. And we derive these physical absorbent from waste biomass. I'm going to talk about that when I get to my slide, but I want to give you the different options. So we can take that CO2 and we can put it into a solid absorbent, and then we can try to do something else with it. The other thing we can do is we can try to separate out that CO2 through using absorbents and MOFs that Mike's going to talk about. And then we can get this very high purity CO2 stream, and then you can use that CO2 to produce methanol and uh, hydrocarbons and other platform chemicals. So you can use the CO2 to actually produce something useful. If, uh, in the wrong direction, it, when we have lots of large volumes of CO2, that's where we start to look at large scale storage, and that's where we get to talk to Dr. James. Well, she'll talk at you, and then you can talk to her after. And in that case, it's do you need that high purity CO2 stream? How, how pure does it have to be? What are all the logistics with these, making sure that you actually seal that CO2 into these reservoirs? And then Dr. Produska is kind of in between all of us. So she does a little bit of work with me. She works with Dr. James. I don't know, do you two work together? Okay, we'll say they work together. So you can think of uh, Dr. Produska as like the tomato in a sandwich. I'm sorry I use that vegetable. Um, Think of her something in the middle of the sandwich that works with all the other sandwich pieces. Okay, so briefly talking about mine, and this is very high overview. We can get into the details after in the questions. In fact, I welcome the details when we get into the questions. So I'm gonna focus in more on cap capture and then I'll kind of introduce what Mike's gonna be talking about. So like I said, there's different ways of removing CO2. You can absorb it in physical absorbance, which is the bottom part or we can try to strip out the CO2 and use it for something else. So I focus on the lower, and what I do is I try to look at waste residues. So I look at mineral, I look at fishery waste, food waste, uh, forestry waste, and we say, we know that's a carbon source right there. If that sits and degrades, it's a carbon source. So could we convert that into something that would fix the carbon in there so it's not a carbon source anymore, and then maybe we can do something with it. And that's where we use pyrolysis or hydrothermal to fix the carbon. But then on top of that, could we take that fixed carbon, which is uh, basically an absorbent, and use it to actually absorb CO2 and other contaminants from gas? So not only do we fix it, fix carbon from the feedstock, but we can actually then put it in a pack bed and put some combustion waste gases through and see if we can absorb CO2. And we found with a lot of our wood-based and fishery-based biochars, we get actually good, pretty good absorption of CO2, of CO. Uh, water doesn't seem to harm it. And now we're gonna, and the tefes here, she's gonna be looking at other things like mixed gases with methane and to see how we can get then generate a carbon-free gas. And then we're working with civil engineers to say, okay, we've got this carbon-loaded char. We can try to regenerate it, or maybe we could take it and put it into concrete or we could incorporate it into soil to enhance soil ability. The soil here in Newfoundland is really acidic. This, this material is pretty good at actually binding nitrogen and uh, increasing the pH of the soil. And it, but it can also be used to replace other non-renewables in concrete, mortar, and we're also looking at asphalt. So that's more what I do. I work with people like Mike and Yan Zhang in the department of process engineering, and they take those combustion waste gases, and instead of absorbing the CO2, what they do is I say, no, let's strip it out. Let's see if we can get a high purity CO2 stream, and let's see how we can use it to produce methanol, hydrocarbons for fuels, and other high value chemicals. So we've got these two different ways. It's not one answer. We can, it depends on the scale of what we're doing, and then it may be that we just go to this larger scale system. So that's all I'm gonna say, and then I'm gonna pass it off to Mike. Uh, I, d I think you have to actually go to. Do I have to introduce Mike? You're going to do. Okay, good for you. Pretend I didn't say anything, Mike. I think. Uh, you'll be slightly disappointed in Mike's in that there's not a lot of animation, so just so you know. 
Thank you, Dr. Halbolt. Our next speaker is Dr. Michael Katz, an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry. Dr. Katz's research is focused on the synthesis, properties, and applications of porous materials. In particular, he is focused on understanding how porous materials can be used to store, separate, and or utilize environmentally harmful gases. His research team is focused on understanding the underlying chemistry so that we can design better materials for these applications. Welcome, Dr. Katz. I'm going to use the microphone, but my voice probably could carry. Um, I started off at the wrong building. I know you know I started off in the wrong building over there. <laughs> and then I walked all the way over here from the other engineering building, so I'm a little bit warm. So I'm a, I'm a chemist. I'm a chemist by training. Um, my mom wanted me to be an engineer. Sorry. Uh, but what I work on is a group of materials called metal organic frameworks. So if you, if you were in my lab and you said, well, I want to see a metal organic framework, it would probably be very similar to some of the powders you see here in the bottom left corner. It would be a blue powder or a white powder or a green powder. And it doesn't really look that interesting, but if we zoomed in on a molecular level on it, what you would see is that there's a lot of empty space in there. And that's because the way we've sort of built it is that it has the scaffolding material that you can see inside the circle where inside there, there's just a lot of unused space. So if you can see those sort of spheres and those bars, there's a lot of unused space inside it. And that unused space is sort of around the size of you know, gas molecules or slightly larger molecules. And so it's a great place to bring gases in or bring molecules in and separate them or convert them or do chemistry with them. And so this field of materials are called metal organic frameworks. They're porous materials and we call them metal organic frameworks because they have sort of these two components. And the way I always think about it is the metal component is sort of designed to give you sort of the shape of the structure. So if you have something that likes to sort of have six attachment points to it, you might get this sort of cube structure that I've shown over here. But you could also find something that has a different geometry that might give you a different shape of the pore. And different shapes of pores might be better at absorbing some gases than absorbing other gases. And so you could have different shaped pores. You can have different size pores. So the organic component, which is the bars that you see in here, you can imagine if I want to make the same mop, maybe I want to have a larger pour because I want to try to store more gases in there. Or maybe I want to make a smaller pour because I don't want to store more gases, but I want to make it stuck in there really, really well. Then what I can do is change the size of the ligand. So you can see an example of sort of different size bars you could put in there, and that would make the same material larger and smaller. And so we can control things about the pour. And of course, the last thing when I'm thinking about this, we can also tune the pore. So let's say that somebody wants to do something for CO2. I might want to bring in a, a chemical group that's really, really good at binding CO2. So a little cartoon in the bottom corner over here where you might want to say I want to absorb this sort of triangular shaped gas. I can attach something to the, my organic part that would bind really, really well to it. And that way I can enhance the ability of that gas or that molecule to bind to that. But if you want to sort of bind the Pac-Man shape thing, you might build something else into it. So we can tune our materials. And so ultimately what we're trying to do is tune a combination of the properties of the pore, the size of the pore, and even the opening of the pore. Because if we can change the size of those features, we can have different applications. So that's the kind of chemistry that we're working on. And there's lots of different, you know, there's lots of different metals, there's lots of different organic components, and there's lots of different MOFs out there. So just to give you sort of a feeling for the world record in most porous metal organic framework, I think a gram of material, if you looked at the surface area inside, would be equivalent to the surface area of a football field. Right, so in a gram, so in a, one of these pellets, there's enough surface area that's the same as a, a, sur a football field. So there's lots and lots of space in some of these record holders to store a lot of gas, separate a lot of gas, and do chemistry inside them. So they're very, very, even though they're not very dense, there's a lot of places inside them to do some interesting chemistry. So how do we use MOFs for sort of car carbon capture and utilization? And I've broken this down to sort of four features of what I'm working on. And so one of the things you could just say, I want to store the gas. I, want to, I have these porous materials. I want to store it. And so the way we approach this is what we do is we try to build different MOFs and we ask the question, what about that MOF makes it good or bad at absorbing CO2? So we have instrumentation that allows us to bring in CO2 and say how much of that CO2 sticks inside as a function of pressure. And we could say, well, that one absorbs a lot. That one absorbs very little. Why? And that allows us to say, well, we now have an idea as to what makes a good material at absorbing CO2. And that's good for some applications. 
But in some cases, what you want to do is you want to separate the CO2. Maybe you don't want to do it by absorbing it. You just want to separate out the CO2. So we also do gas separation in one way, where what we do is we actually design the opening of our materials so that CO2 can go in, but other gases can't. So what happens, you create a barrier where some gases can go through, like CO2, and we can take those off and do some interesting chemistry with them. And the other gases, like nitrogen gas, it's the, one of the other products we get, can just go into the environment because it's harmless. So, right, so we can separate that, and in that case, what we're doing, we're not focusing on the pore, we're focusing on the opening of the pore because something can go in and then it can pass through. So those are sort of two ways of doing it. Now, we're also trying to understand how efficient, how fast, and how energetic is CO2 interacting with the pore. So you think about it, if I make a material that's really, really good at absorbing CO2, uh, if you're a company, you say, great, I'm glad that you have this material that's good at absorbing CO2, but uh, we have to regenerate it so we can reuse it again. How energy intensive is that going to be? And I say, well, it's a lot because we made it really good at that. So we study how well CO2 sticks to materials so we can understand how, what makes it good and how can we optimize it so that it's just good enough to absorb as much as it can, but not so good at the energy penalty of regenerating the material isn't good. So we study the energetics that way. We also study the kinetics because maybe you have a material that's really good at absorbing CO2, but it's very, very slow. And so we have a way of actually testing that. And the way I always sort of compare this to, uh, I have two kids and I have a five-month-old now. You either want a diaper that absorbs a lot or you want a diaper that absorbs very, very quickly. And if you have to pick between those two things, I will let you know that you want the one that absorbs quickly. You're, wor you're willing to give up on a lot. Uh, just ask, just ask me at 3 in the morning. So, right, so we study how fast something happens as well because those are both aspects. If you're going to make a material and you're going to implement it in the field, you want something that absorbs at just the right energy, but you also want it to happen fast enough that you don't have to spend a lot of time waiting for the CO2 to absorb so it doesn't just get out. Now, these are good. This is all we do on sort of these pellets or these powders that we make. But if you're going to sort of put this in the field, I can't just take sort of a bag of powder and you know, dump it on an oil tank and be like, I got this, we've solved this problem. You have to sort of implement it. So one of the things we're looking at is embedding these materials into polymers and into other things so we can make systems that are able to separate that. So we're trying to understand how the properties of the polymer and the properties of our material work together to separate or to store or to work with uh, the most efficient CO2 sort of separation, capture, and storage, stuff like that. So that's the kind of chemistry that we do on porous materials and specifically metal organic frameworks. And yeah, that's, uh, that's the kind of stuff we do in the chemistry department. All right, our next a professor in the Department of Physics and Physical Oceanography here at Memorial. Oops, sorry, here at Memorial. Dr. Paduska analyzes and redesigns carbon-based materials carbonate, minerals, and graphite uh, to harness the benefits of their interactions with water. She leads and works with an inter uh, interdisciplinary teams to address research problems related to improving environmental sustainability, including their science and social justice aspects. Welcome, Dr. Paduska. There we go. Thank you. We'll try that again. So I'm going to talk about something that's a little bit different. We're surrounded by water. And you may not know this, but our oceans hold about 30% of the world's carbon. And you might wonder how that happens. So you know there's carbon dioxide in the air. When that carbon dioxide comes near the water, some of it will dissolve, and it makes carbonic acid. So it's not quite like your carbonated beverages, but it's the same idea. So you get these ions containing carbon inside the ocean water. So what that means is that over time, just like your pop is a little acidic, the ocean gets a little acidic. So that happens over time frames of months to years. So what that means is even if we stopped producing CO2, those higher CO2 levels would lead to more acidity in the ocean over that time frame. So what this means is we've got a real problem. Even if we stop 
we still are going to have these effects lasting. So how in the world do we deal with this? Well, it's interesting because nature has a way to deal with this issue. And what you can see here are there's some, I can't see very well, but there's these, uh, let me see if I can point you the right place here. Oh, I see, it's fancy. Do I point, touch? There we go. I think you can sort of see now. No? I don't know how to point. Anyway, <laughs> there are inlets. So like I said, we've got the atmosphere, we've got the CO2 coming into the ocean and making it slightly acidic. Wherever there are rivers coming into the ocean, slowly it's washing in more alkaline rock pieces. And so over time, that helps balance. Now, that time frame is what's called geological. And if you don't know what geological means, it means it's really long, way longer than we're alive. So we have a really fast process, which is the CO2 from the air coming into the ocean, and a much slower one to fix that. What if we could help speed nature's process up? And that's what's called ocean alkalinity enhancement. So what if we could take some of those minerals and just give them a bit of a head start? We're fixing a problem, right? The problem is that the ocean's getting more acidic. Well, there's some consequences for that too. And it turns out this is a huge research area globally because it's clear that the concept will work because nature does it. What are the consequences and benefits if we speed it up? And that's a really big research question. And so that's one of the things I'm interested in looking at. But the piece I look at is so small, you may not even be able to see on there. So let me just explain a little bit more about what I've got going on here. So somehow, if you've got rivers that are taking these um, alkaline rock bits and weathering them into the ocean, if you are trying to speed it up, you might help things along and take powdered materials and dump them in the oceans, right? And so that's a... I might borrow that, thank you. I thought there was one up here. You get an added bonus, thanks. Ah, excellent. Okay, so one way is you could sort of imagine dumping it. Another thing would be in places where you already have inlets into the ocean, because it turns out these things are very well regulated and you can't just dump things in. So if you're trying to just clean up a stream of water that's already going in the ocean, you could imagine adding some material there as well. But there's a lot of consequences because you have to worry about how fast this happens. You have to worry about whether the particles do this quickly or slowly, to use the diaper analogy we just heard. Um, and you also have to worry about what else is in the water that could be impacted by it. So a lot of these biological, uh, these marine organisms that are in the oceans, many of them actually use the calcium carbonate. And so they're strongly affected by this. And what that means is that it's not really clear exactly what's gonna happen to them. So, what I find interesting and very powerful and challenging about this is that even though we know in principle that this would work, the devil's in the details. We've got to actually get more data to understand where the challenges are when we try to actually do this on a really large scale and in a very messy, interesting, delicate environment. And so what I work on, believe it or not, is a lot of this piece. So if I have calcium carbonate, how fast does it dissolve? When does it dissolve? How does it recrystallize? And I work with other people to help understand more about how would we actually get it there? Does it make economic sense? How does it impact the other organisms in the ocean? So what I love about projects like this is that I have a chance to talk with a lot of people with a lot of different areas of expertise, and it really takes all those minds together to help figure out what happens here. And the goal of this work is not necessarily to say this is the best solution. The challenge is that we need to have a whole bunch of different solutions to look at because there's no one perfect solution that's gonna answer all the problems. And so a lot of what I think about as a physicist is we know that we can't do an experiment on the entire ocean, right? We have to somehow predict and try to model and assume that we can 
uh, help predict and understand what might happen. And key pieces to that are understanding these small details. If we get the small details really wrong or miss some of them, what it means is our models might not accurately represent the risks or the benefits that we could get from it. And so it's by doing smaller experiments like this that I can play a role in helping to make it clearer what the best paths forward could be um, in situations like that. So with that, I will turn it over to my next colleague. Thank you, Dr. Paduska. Our final speaker this evening is Dr. Leslie James. Dr. James is a professor of process engineering focused on Newfoundland and Labrador natural resource development and energy. Fundamentally, Dr. James focuses on understanding the fluid to fluid and fluid to rock interactions of multi-phase flow in porous media from molecular to field scale. She works on multidisciplinary teams and collaborates with industry on the fundamentals used to solve locally relevant challenges such as sustainable, enhanced lower carbon offshore oil production and carbon storage. Welcome, Dr. James. Thank you, Jackie. And thank you, colleagues, and thank you, guests, for being here. Before I go any further, I want to acknowledge that this week is Let's Talk Science, Science Literacy Week. Uh, so Heather, our director, is here. And we have had a whole week of acti activities from spending time in the junior highs to outreach and sto science-related story times, this event as well. And we have Saturday at the Geo Center, where um, at the Geo Center is open from 10 to 4 free admission. We're going to have a talk from Mike, Dr. Mike Pollan on wind power and then a bunch of activities. So if you have kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, come on by. So that's my plug there. Uh, I am going to talk about carbon storage. So that large scale, what do we do with all the extra CO2 that we are and have, well, are producing uh, from predominantly burning fossil fuels, okay? So we, one possible solution is to take that CO2 and store it underground. Does that mouth actually show? Yes, it does, good. Okay, so we would need an injection well, which I'm showing in both of these, so let's assume it's this one over here, and we're gonna pump the CO2 down into an aquifer or an abandoned oil field. In both cases, we're not talking about putting CO2 into a tank or cave underground. We are talking about injecting the CO2 into the pores of a rock. Okay. Now, in oil and gas terms, we call this a reservoir. A reservoir has sufficient storage and it has a cap rock represented by this gray zone or a seal to keep the CO2 or the oil and gas in place. We don't want that leaking up to the surface way up here. So we are used to, as oil and gas engineers and petroleum engineers, we're used to injecting gas and water to help pressurize the reservoir to produce oil and gas. In this case, very analogously, we want to inject CO2. Another interesting thing is, is that depending on the depth of this storage reservoir, and I am hesitant to call it a reservoir, it's, we're often looking at aquifers. So these are not fresh water, drinking water aquifers. These are deeper aquifers, they're saline, they're brine filled, it's not our drinking water, so let's be clear there. Um, but we're looking at aquifers or again, water flooded oil and gas fields um, that are sufficiently deep that the CO2 is actually super critical. Ideally, we want super critical or dense phase CO2 that is liquid-like, okay? It has a gas-like viscosity 
and a liquid-like density. Why do we want it that deep? Okay, Because we can store a lot more if it has the density of 800 kilograms per meter cubed compared to one kilogram per meter cubed. Okay, so the deep, but again, the pressure and temperature of that aquifer or reservoir is going to impact the density of the CO2. It's going to also impact how much energy we need to get the CO2 down there, so to push it down. Um, and the other thing that Kelly mentioned was the purity of the CO2. So if we have 100% CO2, we can actually have supercritical and dense phase CO2 at about 800 meters depth. What if we've got some, you know, some methane in there? What if we've got some nitrogen in there? Because we, our, our capture techniques and our separation techniques aren't perfect. How is that going to impact the density? Okay. How is that going to impact the phase behavior? Now, phase behavior comes into play because that CO2 will go into these rocks and it will migrate. Again, some of this is really, really slow, but if we're pumping it at a fairly good rate, then we're actually forcing that movement as well. So how is that CO2 going to move in the subsurface? What are the different trapping mechanisms? Well, there's the structural trapping, which means just that that impermeable seal on top is keeping the CO2 in place. There's the dissolution and, tra and mineral trapping. So what Chris was talking about, um, where we're going to, you know, the dissolved CO2 in the water, because again, how much we can, how much CO2 that water will take depends on the pressure and the temperature and any salt ions that are in the water. So that dissolved CO2, that carbonic acid, will go and interact with our minerals in the rock. They'll also interact with the salt ions that are in the brine. And so what is all that, how is, how is all of that working? That can actually infect our, our, you know, the risk is that one, what if we dissolve some of the minerals in this cap rock or seal? the smectites, illites, et cetera. There's usually shale, shales as seals. Okay. Is that going to affect our long term? And we're looking, generally we model for 10,000 years. How's that gonna affect our seal? And will we actually get a CO2 leak, like I'm showing here on the left, whereby the CO2 comes up through some of the seal and moves into a secondary porous and permeable zone. Okay. So we need to understand that. Also, if we dissolve some of those minerals, will it impact the structural integrity of our rock? So geomechanically, are we going to make that rock fail? So we also work with geomechanical engineers uh, on this type of, so there's geochemistry influencing the, the geomechanics. That CO2 we can trap in the pores of the rock, so similar to the moths. We're not engineering, we can't engineer what's down there. We could actually potentially inject it with some of those moth polymers, so that's being looked at. Um, and then so how is this combination of trapping working, right? Which one is more important? Does it matter? No, it's what's what matters is that we understand it. What matters is that we understand if we go and do this in a sandstone versus a calcite cemented sandstone versus another quality rock, what those differences are. So we have to be able to quantify that risk. I think it's very interesting. So we've got a multidisciplinary talk and all of our bios talked about our multidisciplinary research, which is very fitting in an engineering lecture, I think, to actually have you know the fact that we've got half scientists, half engineers. And then even the scientists 
talked about engineering principles. Teaching first year engineering, I have to bring these up. One, we talked about football fields, okay? That is analogous estimation, if you're interested. We talked about the consequences of what we're doing. Ethical decision making, okay? And we also talked about quantifying risk. So we really need all levels, and one thing we're doing is working at all levels of fundamental science to the large field scale to understand the consequences of what we're doing and the risk it will have on our different CO2 solutions. I'll just end by saying again, CO2 or carbon capture and sequestration is one part. The different capture techniques we take, the different storage or, or sequestration methods we use are all part of the solution. It's not a competition. It means you just work, you know, there, there are places and um, advantages and disadvantages to each, and we need every solution we can come up with. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you, Dr. James. And thank you to all of our speakers this evening. Let's give them all another thank you. All right, so we're going to begin our question and answer period. And so if you have a question and you want to put up your hand, I'll get the mic to you just as fast as I can. And our speakers, you guys can use the mics on the table, okay? All right, questions. All right, I'm coming. My first question would be to Dr. James. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the throwback to 1040. Yeah, that was my best uh, first year engineering course. Um, so my question to you is, could the CO2 in its super critical stage, could it be pumped out in, let's say, used for stuff like decaffeinating coffee? Great. Uh, thank you for the question. So the question is, can we actually remove the CO2 once we get it into the uh, reservoir? Yeah, like uh, provided that we have that kind of technology that would still keep it in that super critical stage as it's being pumped out and then stored in that way. Yes. So yes, we can. Um, it would mean, so again, the, the fundamental principles we're interested there is understanding the thermodynamics and the phase behavior. So we would operate it just like we operate an oil and gas reservoir at that point, and we would just maintain control over the well uh, and the separation on the facilities to keep the CO2 in supercritical state. So yes, that can be done. Um, I will say that, you know, again, we're working with CO2 and carbonated water, more acidic. Uh, so certainly on the well side and the facility side, making sure we have corrosion resistant material is really important. Yeah. Okay, and I have one more question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my next question. Well, uh, you talked about and I'm interested in what type of compounds are typically used in the linkers. Thank you. Uh, so the question is what type of, what is the, what are these linkers made of? So they're the organic component of it, so they're usually, they're organic based. Uh, they could be almost any organic molecule, but usually what it is is some sort of a rigid core, like a benzene ring, and we usually have carboxylic acids on it, so terthalic acid uh, is one of the common ones, and that's sort of designed so that one of these metal components can easily attach to one group, and on the other side, you can attach it to the other group. So that's usually what they're made of, but they can be made out of all sorts of sort of other organic molecules. The the simplest and cheapest is usually terthalic acid, which is just a benzene ring with two carboxylic acids, one on each side of it.
I can start with the, the, the solid absorbents. The, the whole point is for it to, uh, so with a lot of these biomasses that we convert into carbon absorbents, they are right now, they're a financial burden to most communities and they're a transport issue with the landfills, they're a greenhouse gas issue. So the idea is to turn something that is a waste into a value added product. So behind all of the stuff, I, I, could, I could say for all of us that we do, the idea is you're producing a sustainable product. We try, and in our work, we try to like, no waste left behind. There, if we're so some of the materials we've extracted high value compounds from the waste material already, and we're using the waste from the waste to then use it in these carbon capture. Um, if it's if it's not feasible, then I'm I'm really not that interested in in pursuing it. It ha and it has to be a net benefit to the community and to the region, and then also in the long run, uh, a net positive for the environment. I could add to that for at least the type of materials we work with. There's a company out of Vancouver that works with one of my colleagues at the University of Calgary where they actually are using these porous materials to separate CO2 and then store it afterwards. So there actually are plants that are doing this. So it, ha so it is you know, feasible for these companies to, to make money off of this and to be sort of more environmentally friendly. So I'll just add philosophically, um, I think it would be good if they're they drive an economy and create new industries. That being said, I think we, in order for them to, sh in order for us to shift the paradigm, um, you know, the government funding is needed. And so I'll give a great example in Norway of a, a CO2 storage project. Um, it, it's called Northern Lights, where they're actually taking CO2 from a cement plant further in the fjord, capturing it transporting it by ship, so the ocean and navels are involved, uh, bringing it and storing it near Bergen, and then it goes by subsea pipeline out and is injected into a deep saline aquifer. That is costing a lot of money. It's subsidized by the government. Uh, they don't they have other CO2 sources now coming online besides this one cement plant. But what it's allowing is through this higher TRL level, technology readiness level of actually piloting it, uh, we're able to figure out a whole bunch more logistics and understand these larger scale economics, which are super important to go from benchtop science um, to my lab to modeling, to pilots, to actually implementation. So that's generally the, in, the science to engineering life cycle and, uh, and, and, and for something to actually move into that commercial ready, you know, we do need the, um, the, the, the art research and development supports and everything along the way. But I think the intent is that yes, hey, it's better than maybe a vape economy, right? Or other economy, the lottery economy that we've caught. <laughs> Uh, create it. I'm going to pass it over to Chris. Cause yeah, the other thing I'll point out is, as Leslie mentioned at the end, we need all of these solutions and you can see why. Because if you need to have things that make economic sense at some stage, even for the pilots, you can't do any of these solutions anywhere. So the geography matters. The location of all these other things have huge impacts on what waste is available and what you can do with it. And so that's why all of these have to be explored. What we didn't really talk about is volumes. So how much CO2 can any one of these things do? And the reality is that most of these don't have ready technology to get rid of enough CO2 <laughs> compared to what we have to do globally. So that's why we need so many of these solutions as well.
Yeah, there's a lot of different strategies. So the, the rocks that get mineraled naturally, or excuse me, get weathered naturally, can include silicates and it can be carbonate minerals. So that's one option. Another option is to basically give the ocean a little bit of antacid. <laughs> so you can give it magnesium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, which will also make that more alkaline more quickly. So there's a few different types of materials that can go in to increase that. So where do they come from? Um, there's sometimes people will use leftovers from mining. So again, this idea of using leftovers to help make this kind of thing happen. Um, and so there's clearly transport sort of cleaning issues, making sure that you don't have metal contaminants. That's one of the risks when you're taking these other minerals and putting it in. Um, and so there's pilots. These are, these are being piloted in, in different places um, around the world. Um, there's some work that's being done, for example, in Nova Scotia, uh, looking at this, where they're taking essentially mine tailings, cleaning them up, and you know, testing to see how that works. But I mean, so what you're talking about is, is you know, customized solutions at different scales based on what the source is, what materials we can use or what capture techniques we can use and what kind of volumes we have. So, I mean, that that is the crux of the, the challenge. Uh, it is, you know, we've been you doing carbon dioxide um, capture for a long time, very efficiently in large amine absorption towers, okay? So at a chemical plant level, we've been doing it a long time and it's, it, and it's very efficient. You can get amines that will capture 99% of your CO2. Economically, that doesn't make sense in all places uh, and, and so Again, what can we do? What can we do up the coast of Labrador or in the north where we rely on diesel generators um, and we're burning? What can we do with the cars? Well, the cars is kind of easy because we go to hybrid or we go to electrical vehicles maybe. Um, 
so again, the you know, there's not one solution that fits all. It really depends on your materials, on your, you know, on your capture techniques, the volumes, the purities, and I will add also the political and regulatory frameworks that go along with, right? So if you, um, if you have different incentives in different countries, something, you know, or it, it may make sense there that doesn't make sense somewhere else. I'll add that I think also that, well, it is more difficult to get it from the cars, but anywhere that you're directly emitting CO2 from burning, it's at a higher concentration, it's at 15% CO2, give or take. But if you're trying to pull it out of the environment, you're at 400 parts per million. So, you know, even how good the material works does depend on what concentration is. So it is harder to pull it out of the air once it's dispersed. It's a lot easier for materials to do it at higher concentrations. So there are different challenges even at what sort of concentration you're trying to work with and to solve that. So I think that's another aspect to, to how we have to have so many different solutions that one of my materials or one of our solutions might not work in every single environment, but the idea is that if all of us are plugging away at different sort of solutions, we'll find solutions in different places. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Do you need the mic? That's easy. The answer is no. I have not looked at that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not opposed to it. Do you mean out of ambient or do you mean out of stacks? Because those are two different questions. Yes, and thank you. I forgot my second half uh, of that question as well. I'm unaware of current uh, processes. I'm not an engineer. I'm not in the, in the, in the field. So I'm wondering, do processes uh, produce high quality CO2 streams as a part of their uh, whatever production they're in? So making it easy to capture this high quality CO2? Or when we're looking at carbon capture, carbon sequestration, we need to So when we say high quality, we mean high concentration. So it's, so it, I mean, pulling CO2 out of the air, you know, going outside, and, and that, that's difficult. It's, uh, th there have been proposals on using like hybrid amine systems. I just don't see how that's workable because amine systems are fantastic. They're also really expensive. They're, they, they require a lot of energy to regenerate that amine and then reuse it. But concentrating CO2 is, is fairly straightforward. It's, it's more should you, uh, it, once you concentrate that C CO2, you have to have, do something with it. So you either inject it or use it to make platform chemicals or, or hydrocarbons. When, I, I'm not sure if I'm, but yeah, those, those, like we've been, not just amine systems, physical absorbents, we can take CO2 out of most, stacks it's just um, we haven't been trying because usually when dr. James was talking about uh, taking co2 at gas plants and that we weren't really targeting the co2 we were targeting the h2s and we just it just so happened the co2 oh look at well look at that the, the amine works for the co2 tickety boo but, but it wasn't they weren't trying to target the co2 it's only recently in the past decade or so that we've been actually been trying to target the co2 does that, does that answer your question in a long, stringy way? Well, hello again. Um, I have a question for Dr. Paduska. Um, we know that uh, global warming is decreasing the ocean's ability for absorbing carbon. 
So my question is, how is this taken into account um, in the research for ocean alkalinity enhancement, given that this is a rapidly evolving statistic? So the short answer is you can imagine that temperature always plays a role, but you can also imagine if you just think about what it's like in the winter here and where you'd rather be, the ocean temperature is also vary quite a bit. So it certainly matters um, whether you're looking at a colder ocean or a warmer ocean, determining essentially how deep you want to be adding this, this additional material. So yeah, all of these factors matter, and that's why the modeling piece is important. So it's not only looking at what happens when I take a beaker and do this in a lab. We do care a lot about all of those factors, temperature, salinity, um, many, many different factors. And so it's complex because it's not a closed system, right? These pieces are interacting. And different locations may have very different optimal ways to introduce the material and to actually use that. So uh, yeah, like most of these solutions, it's very dependent on the exact situation. Okay, we have time for one more question. So I'm going to be annoying and give you a pH unit, <laughs> which doesn't tell you anything. I would have to actually look that up. Uh, I So one of the... One of the things that I can say is it's very different as a function of depth. And so if you imagine where the CO2 is interacting with the water, it's right at the surface, right? So the concentration will not be constant as a function of depth. So I don't know off the top of my head, like if I look at the ocean as a whole, how much would be there, right? So one of the ways that people track what's going on is pH. Okay, so pH is essentially your concentration of, of hydrogen ions, and so the more acidic it is, the lower the pH. And so a drop of 0.1 pH units doesn't sound like a lot, but that's already happening, and that's enough to start creating challenges for the marine organisms that are living in the ocean. Now, these kinds of things can happen normally, so a little sidetrack, but if you imagine you've got a, a river that's coming into an ocean, freshwater, saline water, like those two aren't going to match. So you already have seasonal differences in, say, a lot of ocean inlets and this sort of thing where you will have pH changes. And so it's not uncommon for pH to change and for things living in the ocean to move around a little bit or adapt to this. So that doesn't answer your question directly, but it <laughs> it, it helps to point out why modeling how much is there is a harder question than it sounds because you do have to keep track of all of these different inlets, outlets, and sort of depth. Take that one. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so I think the closest to that that you're talking about is in injection into an ultramafic or basalt, okay? So there, and, and to answer your solubility type question, so what we're talking about, right, with the CO, how much CO2 do we have, we're going to reach a solubility limit based on pressure and temperature and everything you learned last fall. Um, <laughs> and then we have to deal with mass transfer of that CO2 migrating downwards, so that's diffusion. But we also have currents happening, so we have convective mixing as well. Okay, so all good mass transfer concepts. But the mix, so to answer the question, we'll have between one to two mole percent based on pressure and temperature. That's your easy answer, even at deep. Oil and, like oil and gas reservoir levels, that's your solubility. It doesn't really get beyond 2%. Cash IR, 
Fatima, correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Uh, but when we're talking about going into the salts, um, and, and Chris is working on that project, and I'm working on that project with Penny Morrill, the lead researcher, and Allison Malcolm, so again, we're multidisciplinary. Um, we're getting some, so we're, we're, we can take the CO2 from the atmosphere or a higher concentration CO2. It's going to solubilize in the water to the maximum solubility it can, which again, 2%. We inject that into a rock, a basalt, and that will react with the magnesiums and other minerals in the basalt and actually mineralize in situ. Okay, and we will get some of that happening in sandstones and carbonates as well, but we'll also get dissolution. So to answer your question, yes, it's combining, it's understanding these same, the reactive transport and the reactive rates and the geochemistry is all playing out. It's very dependent on your concentrations and making it work. And I'm all about talking to Penny and Chris now about actually taking that basalt and instead of, and basalt is really, really low permeability. So when we're talking about our reservoir type stuff, it's really, really hard to you to work with. What if we took that basalt and granularized it and then did some of the reaction either ex situ, so in a tank or in a reactor with, which is, you know, and, and, and then dealt with it and mineral. So any, there's lots of combinations and computations that we can try, but it's understanding the fundamentals and I think all the nuances, um, the devil's in the detail if we want to make sure we don't put, you know, have, have, uh, create bigger problems than that we're trying to solve. Okay, please help me, um, join me in thanking our presenters once again. And thank you to Paul Martin from the University Center for Innovation in Teaching and Learning for handling the technical this evening. And thank you to all of you for joining us. We are so happy that you chose to be here this evening. And so we now invite you all to stay around for a little while and enjoy some refreshments outside. And our speakers will also be out there if you have a few other questions you want to hit them up with. Thank you. <laughs>